All right, it's time to start session number two, Rigor and Reproducibility in Dietary Supplements Research. Our first speaker for this session is Dr. Adam Kusak. Dr. Kusak works for the Office of Dietary Supplements. Uh, he is a health policy analyst and he has been very involved in supporting the administration and oversight of the analytical materials and reference materials program. And he is here today to present about analytical characterizations of dietary supplements, overview of methods, standards, and quality assurance. Okay, thank you, Louisa. Thank you, Reagan, for the invitation uh, to speak today. Thank you all for being here. Uh, so as Louisa introduced, the uh, start of our topic for this afternoon is uh, issues and challenges in analytical characterization of dietary supplements. So our objectives for this afternoon are really to begin going over some of the concepts um, of dietary supplement characterization, concepts of identity, purity, composition, and quality. Uh, we'll give an overview of some of the analytical challenges and needs in dietary supplement research and we'll also describe some of the work of uh, federal agencies and non-government organizations to develop analytical methods and reference materials to address these challenges overall to enhance uh, dietary supplement research and um, enable assessment of product quality. So we've seen uh, sl this slide or you know, the, the text of this slide a few times today, but um, put it up here again because it is a very important general concept here uh, that by the very definition of what is a dietary supplement that leads to um, issues in terms of what is it that you're regulating, uh, what are these products exactly, and the fact that by definition dietary supplements can be very complex in their makeup, their composition, that itself leads to many of the analytical challenges that we'll be talking about. So vitamins, minerals, uh, herbs, botanicals, metabolites, or combinations, all these uh, are, are very different things when it comes to measurement and uh, analysis. The fact that botanicals uh, can be considered dietary supplements, are considered dietary supplements, um, uh, brings another analytical challenge uh, of complexity. Plant material, fungi, or algae uh, are included in this. And the formulation of products themselves, the matrix in, in which they're uh, contained uh, for oral consumption, adds another layer of uh, complexity when trying to characterize. So we um, also heard earlier today the Deshay Act um, codifying the use of good manufacturing uh, processes in the complex, uh, I'm sorry, in the uh, context of this complexity, there's a strong need for supplement characterization. And the Deshay Act uh, touches upon this uh, with the good manufacturing pr practices that have been in place, I think, for about 10 years. Uh, in those regulations, uh, we've heard earlier how it's the company's manufacturer's responsibility to establish specifications and perform scientifically valid testing on materials coming in and products going out. Now beyond uh, regulatory needs, there's also a requirement for well-characterized dietary supplement <coughs> test materials to best inform mechanistic research, uh, efficacy, safety, ADME studies, to best inform clinical trial design, and also the interpretation of the results from those clinical trials. So that uh, in total, thorough characterization of dietary supplements is critical in research for supporting transparency and reporting um, what it is exactly that is being uh, measured or studied. We heard about you know, clinical trials of uh, echinacea in um, prevention of cold, well, what exactly was that echinacea that they were studying, or what exactly was the ginkgo extract they were studying in a memory type trial. Um, this thorough characterization also supports uh, rigor in experiment design 
and really is uh, needed to underlie reproducibility um, uh, across different labs and ultimately comparability of the results from one trial versus another, one study from another. So when it comes to uh, testing and characterization, what we're really talking about here is dietary supplement product integrity and quality. Um, the concept of quality you know, uh, covers a few analytical concepts. We're talking about aspects of does the dietary supplement product, does the experimental test material, does it contain the desired ingredients? Does it meet the minimum and maximum uh, labeled content for what is wanted? Is it clean and free of any contamination? More specifically, there are four fundamental parameters of product integrity, uh, identity, purity, composition, and uh, quality. So we'll address these each in turn. The identity of dietary supplements and their constituents can be pretty straightforward, uh, but it can also be an area where things become unclear. Uh, when it comes to identity of just chemical names, there are uh, certainly many instances where there's more than one common name for a uh, chemical compound, and they can have little relation to their uh, official scientific name, as we see here for coenzyme Q10. Uh, there are also, in some cases, uh, standard-setting bodies, like the United States Pharmacopeia, um, that create monographs for particular dietary ingredients, and, and they're naming nomenclature uh, may be uh, unique and distinct from common ingredient names you'll find on products. Also, researchers need to be aware that certain synthetic analogs may be very distinct chemical entities uh, and perhaps even not considered to be a dietary ingredient. For uh, botanical ingredients, they can add several more layers to issues regarding identity. Uh, there are an estimated about 3,000 plant species currently in commerce uh, in, in some form of, of uh, processing in uh, dietary supplements or in the food supply. And when taking a look at these some 3,000 species, you really start to see other areas where naming something does not always equal identifying what that really is. So you have for botanicals, uh, for plants, you have standard common names that you'll see quite often, um, scientific Latin binomial names, and although not recognized by the FDA, in some instances you'll see uh, traditional medicinal drug names uh, utilized. So you can see various naming um, uh, approaches on labels, and you really need to figure out what exactly is here. Um, this becomes uh, a potential area of confusion or ambiguity uh, when there are instances where a single species, many instances where a single species has multiple common names, but also instances where multiple species can share a common name. Further issues in terms of identity with, um, highlighted here with botanical uh, materials are that challenges in identification increase as the ingredients are more highly processed to then ultimately be incorporated into a dietary supplement product or experimental material. So it might be uh, pretty straightforward to say that this harvested uh, material here is golden seal root, but once that material is further processed, uh, dried, uh, turned into a powder, um, those easy identifications uh, become more difficult. Taking that even further, uh, doing an extraction into some type of uh, solvent material, you then have morphological, organoleptic methodology to uh, identify something, give way to chemical methods to either identify uh, distinct marker compounds, uh, maybe by spectroscopy or um, spectrometry. And you can also have uh, non-targeted identification methods um, to distinguish, uh, for example, here, certain species of cinnamon from one another or to identify a uh, black cohosh amongst related species. 
Now, in terms of purity issues, uh, here we're touching upon notions of, uh, for example, for vitamins, um, is the appropriate isoform or chirality present in the product? For minerals, are the proper chelation state or hydration state present? So in questions like, is this ferrous or ferric iron that is being delivered? Um, chromium-3, chromium-4. Of course, these uh, can result in uh, very important issues when it comes to bioavailability of a particular ingredient or the bioactivity. Uh, again, uh, botanical supplements add a few more layers uh, of uh, challenges in terms of purity issues. Um, you may know that you have the right target species, but do you have the, light plant, the correct plant part? Do you have the leaves or the root? Um, different properties ascribed to the different parts. Um, <clears throat> issues of is there any presence of microbes, uh, mycotoxins, pesticides, harmful, harmful things, also natural toxins inherent in the plant itself. And uh, of course, any undeclared adulterants, uh, accidental or not, fall in this category of uh, purity issues. Uh, for composition issues, uh, again, botanical and natural product supplements also highlight uh, some important considerations here. Um, <clears throat> this may seem common sense, but it's also uh, sometimes overlooked the fact that plant composition is inherently highly irregular. The uh, chemical composition that you would get from different plant parts uh, is highly variable uh, or can be highly variable depending on, again, the parts of the plant that you're harvesting, uh, the age of the plant um, <clears throat> at uh, the point of harvest, uh, any seasonal climate variations, conditions of the harvest itself, and genetic variation can also lead to uh, compositional uh, nuance. And of course, most botanical products are not just unprocessed plant material, so that processing in, uh, in develops a lot more variability as well. Uh, how materials were dried and extracted, what uh, fillers or stabilizers or other components were utilized in the ultimate formulation. Okay, so we've seen how issues of composition, uh, identity, purity, and quality can make it challenging to measure and maintain consistency in finished products. And we've heard uh, again earlier today how these issues are, um, these issues of quality are meant to be addressed by suppliers and manufacturers in their need to establish specifications for um, their products in terms of how they're manufactured and what the final product should be composed of. So for example, uh, ginkgo biloba extracts are standardized to contain um, <clears throat> specific levels of certain constituents, uh, such as not less than 22% and not more than 27% of flavonoids uh, measured as flavonol glycosides. So the regulation mandates that manufacturers must establish the specifications um, for identity, purity, composition, and strength, those regulatory rules, uh, however, they don't mandate what those specifications need to be. They don't mandate how exactly they will be tested for. Um, instead, the uh, regulations state that the specifications must be tested for with methods that are fit for purpose and scientifically valid. So what exactly does that mean? Well, a method that is fit for purpose is uh, one that is sensitive, accurate, precise, specific for certain analytes in a certain kind of material. The results from a uh, test must be demonstrated to be reliable and reproducible, uh, oftentimes in formal validation studies. And nonspecific assays uh, cannot stand alone as a fit-for-purpose assay. So there are many different uh, analytical methods uh, employed in dietary supplement product characterization, uh, morphological uh, analysis, both macroscopic and microscopic, organoleptic analysis, uh, taste and smell, these can all be uh, fit for purpose. Also, a large number of chemical methods, some of which shown here, 
uh, spectroscopy, chromatography, uh, spectrometry, uh, combinations thereof, as well as genetic methods. And depending on what the uh, material is, what the, you're trying to test for, uh, these methods can be shown to be uh, fit for purpose. Again, it's very case by case. Uh, you need to do the work to demonstrate that this is a appropriate methodology. Oftentimes, uh, the answer you really want to get at uh, is better supported if you're using uh, orthogonal or multiple methods that don't um, uh, measure the same thing in the same way. So after setting specifications and establishing uh, what the testing approach will be, um, manufacturers can work with organizations, um, non-government organizations, which exist um, and they set standards and also administer voluntary certification programs. So for example, uh, these standard setting bodies, the NSF International uh, provides test methods and evaluation criteria. <clears throat> they run a verification program where manufacturers can submit their products to be tested to be sure that's meeting its label claims, to be sure that it's free of certain uh, contaminants. The United States Pharmacopeia uh, provides uh, documentary standards on uh, what specifications should be. For example, we uh, a couple slides back talked about ginkgo biloba standardization that is based off a USP monograph for what a ginkgo biloba extract should look like. Uh, USP also provides reference materials um, for performing analytical characterization. We'll talk about that in a little bit more later. They run an audit program and again have a verification program. Uh, manufacturers uh, can demonstrate participation in these programs. You may have seen the, these logos as uh, labels on certain products. For the remainder of um, the, our discussion, I'll describe some federal efforts in dietary supplement characterization. For several years now, and this was, uh, um, I think, not touched upon before, but for several years, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, formerly NCAM, uh, has sought to enhance the rigor and reproducibility of natural product biomedical research by requiring that uh, grant applications uh, document and verify test materials uh, identity, composition, stability, and standardization. Uh, the um, USDA Food Composition and Methods Development Lab uh, runs several projects, some of which are focused on identification and authentication of botanical supplements uh, using uh, methods of spectral fingerprinting and DNA analysis. And the uh, regulatory labs at the FDA Center for Food Safety and Nutrition also are uh, running experiments um, and occasionally publishing on uh, quantification of constituents, adulterants, and contaminants in dietary supplements. <clears throat> the Office of Dietary Supplements, Analytical Methods, and Reference Materials Program uh, sponsors a number of activities that are meant to accelerate the development, uh, validation, and dissemination of analytical methods and reference materials for the characterization of dietary supplements. The AMRAM program's goals of expanding availability of validated analytical methods and producing reference materials are complemented with goals to support partnerships uh, and education activities across government, academic, and industry scientific communities. So through these goals, the AMRAM's program, uh, AMRAM program is designed to really help and support researchers as well as industry, uh, community, and regulators in efforts to ensure the quality of research test materials, meet label claims, develop quality standards, and comply with as well as enforce regulations. So with those goals, what does the program actually do? Well, one of the major activity areas of the program is funding analytical method development and validation. So some of the programs supported work at FDA, USDA, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, 
uh, work there is focused on developing methods to identify specific supplement ingredients and quantify their constituents in products as well as experimental materials. Uh, I think I might have not mentioned that there's also work at uh, academic research labs that is supported, uh, again, for identifying um, uh, constituents and metabolites of dietary supplements in both experimental uh, materials as well as uh, biological samples. Well, AMRAM also funds uh, efforts to publish scientifically validated methods, um, meaning that a method's performance in these measurement parameters has been formally assessed. And the program also uh, supported the development of guidelines specific for dietary supplement and botanical method validation studies. So the analytical methods reference material program uh, also utilizes two main programmatic approaches to promote the performance and publication of method validation studies. First, um, another standard setting body uh, internationally recognized, um, AOEC International Standards Development Groups are supported in which dietary supplement community stakeholders prioritize analytical method needs uh, both in the industry and the research communities. And they define what method uh, performance requirements would meet those needs. Uh, expert review panels are then convened and evaluate uh, candidate methods to see if they uh, have the potential to become official methods of analysis. You can see the large uh, 20th edition book of the AOAC official methods of analysis. These are gold standards uh, in the dietary supplement regulatory and uh, industry communities. So multiple official methods of analysis uh, have been published through the AMRAM activities, uh, several of them listed here, and you can follow these links if you're curious about um, what these are looking at and how they're looking at them. Uh, these methods have touched upon needs for the quantification of a variety of constituents, including vitamins, minerals, botanical markers, and contaminants. Again, in both dietary supplement finished products as well as incoming ingredient and, and raw materials. Since 2011, the Office of Dietary Supplements has also supported the performance and publication of formal single laboratory validation studies on methodology through uh, supplemental funding. Um, Dr. Urshaw mentioned in the previous talk about uh, the supplemental funding mechanism, uh, NIH grant support, so this is an example of that. Um, supplemental funding to NIH grantees where the um, funding opportunity here is, uh, considers proposals whose analytical method that's being developed it quantifies bioactive or marker constituents, adulterants, contaminants, and or their metabolites in dietary supplement materials or biological samples. So this, thus far there have been uh, 12 uh, or so awards. Uh, through this mechanism, a uh, complete listing of them can be found on our website. And if you're curious about this uh, funding opportunity, please uh, ask me. In the area of standards and quality assurance, AMRAM funds the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, to produce standard reference materials. And these are homogeneous stable materials with certified measurement values for specific nutritional, botanical, or toxic constituents. So for example, in the picture here, a uh, standard reference material, uh, botanical oils containing omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. So this is a um, representative material that can be used to um, develop methods, to validate methods, and uh, can be critical for instrumentation calibration. Having a, a material where there is a defined known amount of, for example, um, uh, a particular omega-3 fatty acid, we can develop a method of how am I measuring that acid, 
uh, that fatty acid, this material can be used as a standard uh, control. So a number of uh, dietary supplement related standard reference materials have been produced uh, by NIST, supported by the ODS AMRAM program. Um, a number of them illustrated here, uh, covering botanicals as well as um, some more um, nutritional uh, related um, analytes. And the overall goal here of the program is to increase and expand the uh, type of standard reference materials related to dietary supplements, ex uh, increase their availability to, again, industry as well as researchers. There's also a number of uh, additional materials currently in progress. Um, again, here are several uh, botanical and other types of dietary supplements being developed for reference materials. So AMRAM also funds NIST to administer a dietary supplement quality assurance program in which uh, industry, government, and academic laboratories measure active or marker compounds as well as some toxic elements in samples distributed by NIST. The lab's results are assessed for accuracy, precision, and concordance within the community. And then NIST uh, organizes workshops and distributes reports on these exercises to uh, discuss the results, to uh, discuss uh, any advances in methodology that have developed. A number of quality assurance exercises have been held uh, to date, measuring many different nutritional, botanical, and toxic constituents, uh, kind of sh shown here. I don't need to read the list, I think. Um, but they've also been measured in a variety of types of materials. So examples of these exercises are shown here uh, uh, from the reports. So we'll see the uh, results of several labs along the bottom here measuring uh, riboflavin in a protein drink, standard reference material, or measuring arsenic in a St. John's wort reference material. Um, and the target range is denoted in gray here. This is that certified value for this is truly how much uh, riboflavin or arsenic is in this material with the uh, confidence interval range. And you can see the labs that were, met that uh, target range and the other labs were outside of that target range. Now these exercises um, are not regulatory activities but rather the purpose of the quality assurance program here is to enable labs to assess their performance, uh, identify areas for improvement. <clears throat> um, for example, in a 2010 exercise looking at uh, total catechins in a green tea material, um, you can see that a large number of labs fell outside of the target range interval for what the total catechins were. You can actually barely even see the little blue dotted box here of the target range. Um, and after this exercise, uh, after identifying and reducing calibration errors, uh, many labs in a follow-up exercise two years later uh, were then able to uh, vastly improve their performance. Now, similar uh, to, these pro to the Dietary Supplement Quality Assurance Program, NIST also administers quality assurance programs for the measurement of vitamin D metabolites and fatty acids in serum. Um, again, similar types of activities, similar types of reports. So clinical labs can uh, participate in these studies to be sure that they're uh, measuring uh, things with the appropriate accuracy and precision. So we've gone over um, several concepts here uh, at a good clip, um, but to just kind of conclude what we're uh, going over today, uh, we've seen how dietary supplement composition can be very complex um, with botanical supplements adding another layer of inherent variability. Uh, so these issues represent significant challenges to both industry and researchers in terms of uh, characterizing, analyzing what the materials are. Uh, nonetheless, these challenges need to be met both for regulatory compliance as well as 
supporting uh, the most rigorous and reproducible biomedical research possible. Uh, and there are a number of federal and industry programs out there that are supporting dietary supplement characterization and efforts to, again, enhance that rigorous research. So with that, I'll end. Um, and I see that uh, we're doing good on time. So thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions. Yes. Um, could you address a little bit about the issues with a uh, really growing area today, which are the probiotics and the issues with the microbiologic characterization and the whole concept of dealing with living organisms? All right, it's a good question. I'll, um, I think I'll be able to touch on that a little bit, but I'll also um, uh, probably def have to defer to uh, asking the similar question to our uh, speaker from FDA uh, via her contact information. Um, and um, perhaps uh, Dr. Cindy Davis uh, is an expert in microbiome stuff too. She can touch upon uh, a lot of the research on probiotics and microbiome. In terms of um, method development, in terms of measuring uh, things there, um, currently, the, I think what I'll just kind of say is that a lot of the um, efforts that the AMRAM program is, uh, a lot of the activities are stakeholder driven. Um, so needs from the community, the research community, the industry community. Um, thus far, uh, some of those topics have not been uh, addressed, but they're kind of sitting out there um, waiting to be addressed further. Um, I don't know how much more I can specifically say about uh, various methods um, that are being developed in terms of kind of characterizing probiotic uh, material, uh, or I should say probiotic products. Uh, I, I can see Cindy's uh, ready to add some insight. Well, I'll just add that USP is actually looking at this right now and is in the process of developing monographs to look at characterization of different microbes in probiotic dietary supplements. All right, thank you, Cindy. Yes. So my question is in regards to that reference manual that you alluded to in earlier slides. Um, is that an, you said it's an international one, right? So um, I, one that I referred to was the AOAC official methods of analysis. Um, let me. Yeah. You probably have it on your screen, this one? Yeah, that one. So with that being said, how, how much in terms of for supplements are international studies looked at and then accounted for in a major analysis of efficacy? Because I have a lot of patients that say, well, this is going on in China or this is going on in India. And there's not really accessible research that we see here in the States. So I'm, my question is in regards to just more of a global scheme, mm -hmm. how, how much of the pool is accounted for the, the same standards? Are they, are they comparable to American studies, not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. Um, so a couple of things there. Um, the official methods of analysis here, uh, yes, indeed, this is um, internationally recognized um, uh, collection of methodology to get at the characterization of either the raw materials or the products. Um, and there can be methods in there that um, uh, have been utilized in uh, standardization of products um, uh, internationally. Um, when it comes to assessing the scientific literature of what biomedical research is being performed internationally, um, that becomes uh, an interesting question and, you know, you really have to, as the, uh, to the best of your ability, um, take a look at what literature you can get your hands on and figure out what exactly it was that they studied. So, um, you know, was there a study from University X that measured um, turmeric? 
for some health outcome. Well, if their report gives you no indication of what was that turmeric, um, was it uh, you know just the the root? Was it the curcumin? Was it a certain mix, uh, percentage of curcuminoids? What exactly was it? Uh, you know, it becomes very difficult to assess what they were even doing. Um, I, I think that there is um, going back to standard setting internationally. Um, I might actually defer to my colleague Joe Betts, who already has his microphone on, ready to jump right in. He, he actually uh, is involved in some of those international standard setting activities. So I'll turn the floor over to Joe. Yeah, um, as far as the composition of products and the analysis of products, the AOAC book is just a big book of methods. Okay, so, you know, chemical tests for measuring targeted compounds. The United States Pharmacopeia sets quality standards for everything from drugs, uh, they own the Food Chemicals Codex, so they set some standards for foods, and dietary supplements. Uh, there's a Chinese pharmacopoeia that sets quality standards for Chinese, and um, that is a very uh, respected body. Uh, I know several individuals who are excellent scientists that sit on that, so that big book of methods and quality standards is pretty good. I sit on a, 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 a Hong Kong government committee that also sets standards for uh, uh, Chinese uh, traditional medicine herbs, um, and that's a very scientific. They have an international advisory board, uh, people, scientists from all over the world. The European Pharmacopeia has lots of standards, but these are just quality standards for the materials uh, that are that are in commerce. Uh, as far as the studies, the, the efficacy studies are concerned, um, you bring up a good point because if you look at the Cochrane reviews. You can look at some of the Cochrane reviews for some very popular botanicals, and quite often you'll get, well, not enough evidence for efficacy or safety, or promising, you know, some indication that this is efficacious, but more work is required. And oh, by the way, the product um, uniformity makes the literature difficult to interpret. So differences between dosage forms. Um, you know, so my go-to place for that sort of hard evidence is Cochrane reviews, and most of the time the Cochrane reviews for botanicals especially is, you know, uh, not very encouraging. Um, NCAM, or NCAM, sorry, NCCIH has fact sheets on herbs. Uh, you can get to those from the ODS website as well. Uh, and they look at the, the totality of the evidence from scouring the world's literature, and they draw conclusions about, you know, whether something is safe and efficacious as well. Again, uh, in a lot of cases, they, the evidence is not really all that strong or solid, so sometimes it's, yeah, there's some indication that it works or doesn't work, and most of the time is more work is needed. Um, the, some commercial databases, uh, Natural Medicine's Comprehensive Database publishes, uh, you know, tables of, you know, believability of claims and things like that. Um, trying to collate the world's literature on efficacy for, for these things is, is difficult. Um, there are certain com countries whose traditional medicines are just assumed uh, to, to, to be efficacious and safe because they've been in use for 3,000 years. Uh, countries that have had that attitude in the past are starting to move towards the realization that if they want to sell those products in the United States and Western Europe, they are going to have to prove that they are safe and efficacious. So, so the Chinese government, for instance, is starting to spend large quantities of money on efficacy trials, which several years back, maybe a decade ago, was unheard of. All the research was on composition and quality assurance. Um, you know, so, so my advice is be patient because the world is moving in that direction. At the moment, it's, you know, it's a fertile field for writing grants. Lots of questions. <laughs> Um, on that same topic, I know my colleagues in nutrition in Europe and Canada are a little more progressive in terms than the United States in nutrition interventions and from the holistic point of view in food first and supplements. So a lot of times I cross-read. Do we have any formal um, relationship with your equivalent 
the NIH equivalent in Europe and Canada to combine research so we don't all duplicate services and techniques. So they've been using herbs and supplements long before we were officially. Um, several of us sit on the same committees and bounce between continents. <laughs> Uh, you know, when scientific advisory boards for EFSA, for instance, or, or for, you know, the EMA uh, in Europe, um, uh, I was on the natural health products uh, advisory, scientific advisory board when they had an advisory board. That's a Canadian organization. Um, there's a lot of international cooperation that I can see, but not a whole lot of coordination. Uh, People tend to, 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 to think that they've got the best system. Uh, and while they look in other places for advice, um, they won't necessarily adopt things and harmonize just for the sake of harmonization. Um, they want you to show them that the harmonization is justifiable and, and, you know, and, and made for scientific reasons. Um, and that's worldwide, that's you know, uh, global. Uh, the organizations do talk to each other, uh, I do know that, but aside from that, formal coordination of efforts, research efforts and things like that uh, in many areas is rare. Um, there are some nutrition, very promising uh, nutrition related uh, 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 efforts that are going on. So. Uh, ODS started and now coordinates something called the Vitamin D Standardization Program. And that's an organization, or that's, that's a, an effort that is truly international in scope. Because what we discovered when we started this, and this came out of the, uh, the analytical methods program, was that different vitamin, clinical vitamin D uh, uh, metabolite uh, uh, measurement platforms yield different numbers. Uh, and so if the Danish vitamin D status uh, survey is using one method, and the American vitamin D standard or your survey is using a different analytical method, you're gonna end up with two different pools of different numbers. Uh, and so now there are organizations from all around the world that have gotten together uh, and we have come up with a way to standardize those measurements globally to, no matter what measurement platform you're using. Um, but that was almost an ad hoc uh, thing where somebody just had to grab the problem and drive it. In our case, it was uh, Chris Sempos in ODS uh, and somebody named uh, Linda uh, Thienpont uh, in, in Belgium, uh, University of Ghent, who, who, who kind of conceptualized this. Um, and, you know, but, but it was individuals th that, that really decided that this was a major public health need, and then they coordinated the resources of their institutions around this effort. So now vitamin D is, is, is the start, but I think that there are going to be similar efforts for iodine and other sorts of nutritional, uh, you know, nutritional problems. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay. okay. Um, I'd like to ask especially about botanicals. So is it a manufacturer's responsibility uh, under good manufacturing practice to standardize a botanical, or is it not? And if yes, uh, how do they typically standardize? You know, do they take a specific compound like flavonoids in ginkgo biloba, or how, how is it done? Well, um, the regulations are that they set specifications, but not that they create a, uh, you know, basically they, they standardize their own product based on their own specifications. Two companies can have different specifications um, uh, in, a, in certain cases. Um, the example that I showed with the ginkgo biloba, uh, that was a standard for ginkgo biloba extracts that was set by the United States Pharmacopeia, the USP, uh, one of their monographs. So um, for that particular um, product, ginkgo, ginkgo biloba, you know, kind of a uh, uh, high commodity in, in the market, a lot of the, the companies are adopting that standard more or less uniformly. Um, 
for something else that that is not as widespread, you know, it's the company would set the specification, and then it's um, the rationale for setting a specification to, to be this percent or that percent, uh, you know, can be any number of things in terms of what is achievable, what's been shown to be efficacious. Um, for you also set specifications for uh, you know the presence of uh, potential harmful things. So you need in that same ginkgo biloba side, some of those are um, harmful toxins. And so there's, the specification is it can't contain more than this low uh, 3% amount. Um, does that answer? Yeah, more or less, okay. yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.